Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Will Hamilton on from Fuzzy Yellow Balls. Will, welcome. Will, what's going on, man? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have this call. Um, being a, an online uh, kind of tennis uh, person myself, you're kind of uh, the the king of online tennis content. Um, I know you've been doing this for a long time, and you've worked with uh, the Bryans, with Martina Navratilova, uh, Gigi Fernandez on the court, giving lessons to club doubles players. Um, so this is going to be a really good episode. I'm really, uh, really excited for this. Yeah, I've certainly been at it a minute. Um, <laughs> I got started, <laughs> uh, got the idea back in 2006 because um, mm -hmm. I was uh, like YouTube was like literally a couple months old. I guess YouTube started in 2005. So maybe it was maybe it was about a year into YouTube. Um, but I came across this one instructional video that had 55,000 views, mm -hmm. which was just like an incredible number of views back then. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, like this is something I could do. Um, and then that sort of started the whole the whole process, got our first videos online in 2007 and kind of iterated it from there. Awesome. So uh, I want to go back. How did you get started in tennis? What's your your background? Um, I know you've played. uh for a long time, but, but start at the beginning. Sure. <laughs> the beginning, well, the beginning is, uh, uh, my dad, um, who's from a small town in Chester, South Carolina, which, you know, I, no one listening to this has ever heard of it, I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. but he, when he was in high school, started playing on this old dirt court, um, and just loved it. And, and, uh, uh, ended up playing on Davidson college's tennis team, which is Charlotte, North Carolina. You might know it because people know Steph Curry. Right. Um, so yeah. that kind of, yeah, exactly. So that Steph helped put David's make David's a little bit more mainstream for sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, dad's played his entire life. Mom's actually, um, played too coincidentally. So when I was a little baby, there was a tennis ball in my, is it pronounced mobile? Like what's the thing that sort of spins around above a baby's head? Oh, I, baby I don't have kids. Like so the I baby don't know thing. that, but yeah, I know exactly. what you're talking about. I yeah, just exactly. the, the baby thing. That's the technical term for it. So there was baby. a tennis ball you were on your back kind of reaching up for. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Just learning how to call the lines and everything. Um, uh, they taught me early. Yeah. <laughs> I could call the lines before I even know how to swing a racket, but um, you know, started playing as soon as I could hold a, hold a stick and, um, you know, played in high school, played, I actually went to Davidson college as well. So I was okay. on the Davidson team. Um, and then I, nice. uh, I taught a little bit, uh, in real life, you know, air quotes in real life, mm -hmm. uh, right after I graduated and then, you know, saw this video on YouTube and was like, huh, you know, I could, I could do this on the internet. And so I, uh, I said to, to my parents, um, I was living at home at the time. I was like, Hey, can I start a website in your basement? And my dad was like, yes, on one condition that you don't bring shame to the family. And I was like, I'm naming the website fuzzyyellowballs.com. <laughs> and that was the start of it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so then it, how did you, how long did this transition take from like in-person coaching to like mostly online? Well, we didn't, you know, so it's one thing to put videos on the internet and it's another to have it be a business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and get people to watch can, them. Yeah. That yeah. can where you can afford your own rent and move out of your parents' basement. So it took, I'd say two to three years before we figured out uh, a, a business model, which, mm -hmm. um, which honestly the, the, the model is pretty straightforward at this point. It's just kind of like Netflix for tennis lessons. Like people just come and they can yeah. either buy a product as a standalone, or you can subscribe to kind of get everything. Right. Um, and then so, since then, sorry, go ahead. But I was going to say the only thing that was, the only thing that was hilarious about it was when we first started it, uh, I would get emails, um, uh, mostly from husbands, but they would ask me to explain to their wives why fuzzy yellow balls was on their credit card statement. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So I had to change it to like FYB tennis or something like that. Make it a little clearer. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that actually happened. Like that's a real thing. It's uh, funny. <laughs> so since then you, um, You've released tons of tennis content, a lot of it on the court with club level doubles players, mm -hmm. um, anywhere from what, like three Oh to four or five mostly. Yeah. I right? think that's the, I think what, what aren't most players like three, five to four Oh, I'd say that's yeah, kind three, of five to four Oh. Yeah. Um, um, but anywhere it, from three Oh up to four or five. I think the, the thing we try and focus on a lot of time is, is a uh, strategy. 
which yeah. um, kind of is the same at, at all levels. Obviously, the more you know, the, the more competent you are, the, the more shots you have in your arsenal, you can do a little bit more. But um, right. the fundamentals of strategy, at least, are the same at all levels. Yeah, yeah. The principles like still apply whether yeah. it's the pro level or the yeah. three yeah. five level for sure. Um, and then fast forward, you start releasing, I think you released the singles playbook first, right? And then the doubles playbook after that. So actually, um, the current version of the doubles playbook and the singles playbook, they're physical books. Mm -hmm. uh, now with, uh, you know, every page has a play on it. And then there's a QR code you can scan with your phone that'll take you to a video explaining what you're looking at. But the original doubles playbook was back in 2011, and it was an online mm -hmm. course with Bob and Mike Bryan. They were the okay. first pros that I worked with. So we originated the concept way back then, and then uh, uh, it kind of stayed in that same form for about eight years. And then I think it was 2018 mm -hmm. uh, was when we first made the singles playbook, which was, which was the first physical book. You're right about that. And then okay. we kind of iterated it from there. Got it. Once, okay. once QR codes became more common, and yeah. that tech was built into someone's phone where you didn't need to download a QR code reader. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so before we dive into it, what we're going to do here for people listening is we're going to go through three of these plays. So um, you gave me access to it last week. I took a look. Uh, there are how many plays in this playbook? 48. 48 plays. Okay. For the so playbook, yeah. Yeah, so it's everything you can think of from, from serve strategy, serve and stay back, serve and volley, mm -hmm. return strategy, uh, rallying, net play, uh, all sorts of stuff. And um, you worked with the Bryans as well as Martina Navratilova, Gigi Fernandez. Mm -hmm. Combined, they have 102 Grand Slam titles. Something um, like that, yeah. Yeah, that's what it says in the video, anyway. Yeah, well, then that's then uh, that's right. I think I'm trying to think of like Bob and Mike won another one after. I don't think so. I don't think so. But um, regardless, time. it's an insane amount of Grand Slam titles. So it's literally the best doubles players of all time. Yeah. And what I love about it is is how you um, worked with them, got their plays, and you distill it down to where a club level player can execute it. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we're not going to be able to serve a, a bomb down the tee for, uh, you know, to set up our net player every time, but uh, we can hit a body serve, right? Like that's, that makes sense. So um, you take their plays, you work with them, you distill it down. It's 48 plays, you get a physical copy, uh, and we're going to go through three of the plays here. Um, but before we do, is there anything I missed in that explanation of the doubles playbook? And then let's dive into uh, sword versus shield. No, that was great. I'm trying to think if um, if you I don't think I mean, it. you, you kind of nailed it. It was just um, like Bob and Mike. And if you've ever seen the video, so I'm five, eight and they're six, four. So just even me standing on court next to them is this like juxtaposition of like <laughs> professional athlete and then will, you know, <laughs> um, and I remember back when we first released those videos, you would get comments that are like, you know, these guys can serve 130 miles an hour and I can't do right. that. Right. And, um, you know, I, I was cognizant that people were going to say that. So it's just like, look, that's not what we're focusing on right now, because um, these guys and gals are doing things uh, that we can copy. Like, what are they looking for? Like, what is a, mm -hmm. a, a, a subtle movement from their opponent that's going to tip off where they're going to uh, uh, return the ball, which we'll talk about in the in the prognosticator in a second? Or what is a shot you can hit that doesn't you know, need to be 130 mile an hour bomb, but it can set you up for the next shot. Right. Right. That's something most folks can do. Right. Yeah. And the, I think the key for people in getting started is just to stay kind of more aware on the court and like know what to look for. And this kind of helps set them up for that. Um, and then kind of going through them myself, one of the other things that I took away was if like one play doesn't work for you, because you have certain strengths or certain weaknesses there there's 47 other plays. So, yeah. you know, or, or if it's not working against a particular team, you know, so if you have all these different plays to pull from, uh, it's kind of like having more tools in your toolkit. Like you, you're, you're going to know during the match, Oh, this one's not working. Let's try this one. You sure. know, it's the classic, so, like you got plan a, but you sometimes you need a plan B. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So explain sword versus shield before we uh, dive into these plays. Yeah, this is so, so I, the, the term sword versus shield is basically just uh, your strength and your weakness. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not a term I made up. Uh, I've heard a number of other coaches uh, use that. The first time I ever heard, like Craig O'Shaughnessy, our buddy uses that. Yeah, I've heard um, him use it as well. The, yeah, who did you said? Yeah, I've heard Craig use it as well. Yeah, Craig yeah. uses it. And the first time I ever heard it was uh, a, a coach here in D.C. named Yano Zhu, who okay. um, has done some stuff online. His website is Fifth Set. Um, and he's a, he's a great coach. He's a very good player. He was, he was a very highly ranked junior uh, mm-hmm. from France. But he was the, as far as I can recall, he was the first person I ever heard it from. And so what uh, I guess the, the layer you could say, uh, at least I think I added it, I don't know if somebody else came up with this, was when you're looking, if you like visualize a tennis court in your head mm-hmm. and you first say, okay, on my side of the court, um, where is the sword and where is the shield? Like which side? And for a righty, for a right-handed player, um, like a, you imagine yourself looking across the court, your sword is going to be your forehand probably, so it's on the right, and then your shield is going to be on the left. But then if you're playing a right-handed player, if you did the same thing for them, from your perspective, when you're looking across the court, their sword is going to be on the left-hand side and their right. shield is going to be on the right-hand side. Mm-hmm. And so what that means is you would have uh, swords on the diagonal and shields on the diagonal. Hopefully this makes sense. Or yeah. if you, if you hit your, yeah, you know, you have, if you hit your forehand down the line, it's going at the person's backhand, right? That would be right. sword down the line at a shield. At a shield. Yeah. Yeah. And so the reason I thought that was important is you need to know um, where all this stuff is because cool you might be trying to attack someone's shield but if you're hitting down the line to do it that can be quite a low percentage shot Mm -hmm. which also opens up their ability to go cross court which is the safer shot now at Mm -hmm. your shield so it really you know when you're talking about again if this is audio it might be a little convoluted but um it was all about understanding um your strengths and your weaknesses your opponent's strengths and weaknesses and how it works with the geometry of the court because the court is of course a rectangle right so that's the concept is where is everything and how does it work with relation to the geometry of the tennis court yeah yeah that makes sense and there's there's a good video that describes it for people who uh who are having trouble visualizing but most people who listen to this podcast i'm talking about the court all the time so hopefully they can uh, kind of follow along and the reason I just use sword versus shield is because sometimes your forehand's not your best shot, right? right. So um, it just made it sort of a, a, a way you could kind of standardize, like where's the strength, where's the weakness versus forehand right. back end. Right. Yeah. And, and sometimes it, this is really important to like analyze for your opponent when you step on the court. So you can start this. Um, I've had some other guests on the podcast who have said to you know, check out their forehand and backhand during warm up. you know, and, and figure out yep. kind of which one's better. Um, and then for a lot of players, their forehand's, you know, more powerful, but it'll yield a lot more errors. So yep. in that case, sometimes you want to figure out, you know, what type of forehand do they like and how can I force more errors on that side rather than just avoid it because they hit it hard. Yeah, you know? sure. So, Maybe force them to hit a running forehand and that's where you draw all the errors. Exactly. Like a simple, a simple way to think of like the orientation again, like two righties, if their forehands are the strength, you've got sword versus sword on the diagonal, right? The cross Mm -hmm. court. But now if you're playing Rafael Nadal, who's a lefty, then the diagonal is sword versus shield. And that's one of the reasons Rafa is so tough is he's hitting his forehand, his sword cross court at a righty's backhand, their shield. And he just breaks it down. He just keeps, it's not, his strategy is not particularly complicated. A lot of times he just hits the ball cross court a million times. Then you hit it short and the point's over. Right. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's dive into this first play. Um, The first one to go over here is the prognosticator. So what we'll cover for each of these is uh, what is the play? When should we be using it? Mm -hmm. And then how exactly do we execute it? And I know there's going to be some kind of nuance in some of these as well. So. Sure. Um, let's start with the uh, the prognosticator. Sure. So the prognosticator, and it's spelled uh, 
P R A G U E hyphen. And then like Nosticator. So I was trying to be clever. Like Martina yeah. Nevislova is yeah. uh, from Czechoslovakia. So Prague uh, or the former uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, now the Czech Republic. Um, and so uh, that was our attempt at being clever. <laughs> but <laughs> so the, uh, the play is, is, um, pretty straightforward. So let's say you were the, you, you were serving in the deuce court mm-hmm. and, uh, you're going to hit a, a body serve. Yeah. Uh, and so if, if from your perspective, your team's perspective, if you hit a body serve and your opponent moves towards the middle of the court to get out of the way of the ball, to hit a forehand, mm-hmm. you're very likely going to pull that ball cross court. Right. Uh, just so this is one of those things where it's like you don't need to have 130 mile an hour serve. It's just if you hit a body serve and you see your opponent moving to the middle of the court, so it'd be the yeah. right from your perspective to hit a forehand, probably going to pull it cross court. Right. Um, and so what that means for your net player is that is a good time to either pinch. Uh, pinch is basically just kind of where you go stand in the middle of the court. You don't full poach, but you just kind of instead of split yeah, stepping pin- forward pinch you towards the middle. Exa- yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and that's a term I learned from Bob and Mike Bryan. They, 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 they basically were like, whenever first serve goes in with some exceptions, they would just pinch. They would just kind of split towards the middle of the court versus yeah. splitting forward. Cause they're just trying to clog, you know, the cross court safest shot clog the middle of the court. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the first thing to look for, but really uh, the shot that makes this play is let's just assume the, you, you are serving and volleying. Let's assume the return gets by uh, your net player and comes yeah. back to you. Uh, and you're hitting that first volley. A lot of people think that you have to volley that ball deep, right? Hit mm-hmm. your volleys deep. That is a very, very common piece of advice. It's not necessarily wrong, but if you hit a volley deep and it's not a ball you've hit hard that skids, uh, that takes time away from your opponents, then a lot of the time uh, your opponent has a lot of options. They can hit a passing shot through the middle down the line, maybe a dip or cross court. If they've got that shot on their forehand, they can lob, but there's a lot yeah. of stuff you would have to defend. Right. Cause and it's so, just like a routine ground stroke that they would get yeah. in a clinic almost. Exa- exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're giving them a rally ball. And mm-hmm. so Martina has this volley called the newt volley. And mm-hmm. the first time she said it to me was actually during a take. And I was like, wait, what did you just say? Yeah, I think I like, just watched new? that video. And she's like, <laughs> yeah, she's like, do you say new volley? She's like, no, newt, like the lizard, like N-E-W-T. Yeah. And I was like, why do you call it that? And she's like, I don't know. The, the newt's kind of like this almost like nothing lizard. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the newt volley is short and low. Um, and you're not, you're not, you're not, you, you kind of want, basically you don't want to hit it super hard because you want to pull your opponent into the court. You want them running forward yeah. to hit a, uh, a low ball. So it's not, it's not like a drop shot, but it's landing like around the service line maybe. And it's slow Correct. and low. Yeah. And you're, it's not, it's you're pulling not a drop them shot forward yeah. to kind of reach. So they're like exactly. reaching forward to try to hit this next shot. Yeah. It's not supposed to be a winner. You, you, you're, I mean, you're expecting them to get to it. You want to make mm-hmm. sure you get it by like you want, if it's a drop shot, the, the net opponent can run over and get it. And a drop shot will probably sit up. No, you're trying yeah. to, you're trying to keep it low. You kind of want it to bounce and skid. You just don't want it to bounce very high. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to, what you're trying to get is the baseline opponent running forward to hit a low ball mm-hmm. because it's going to be very difficult to pass from there. Any passing shot attempt they hit, the ball is going to be rising obviously to get over the net and then right. ideally rising when it still gets to you. So you can hit down on the next shot. Right. Uh, Martinez says something that's very simple. A very simple way to think about doubles is you want your opponents to be hitting up and you want to be hitting down. Like yeah. If you can set that up a lot, you're going to win. Mm-hmm. So the newt volley is that ball that stays, it's, you know, short, low, it could be down the middle. It could be angled. The most important thing is just short and low force mm-hmm. them to hit up. When you pull them inside the court, very difficult to hit a good lob off of that. Right. So even if somebody does lob, you're going to probably have an overhead you can do something with. It's unlikely mm-hmm. that they're going to, it's certainly not going to be a topspin overhead. Yeah. Uh, or an offensive overhead. So it just puts you in the driver's seat to hit down on whatever your next shot is. And then you can just aim it either away from them uh, or just down at their feet uh, where, you know, that's a, that's a tough volley. 
Got it. Yeah. So this is something, um, this is a play I use a lot. Uh, I've never, um, I think I started using it before I saw your video. Uh, sure. but, I, I, you know what? You know what? I didn't invent it. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a great uh, a great play. Obviously, ideally, uh, your net player gets involved right in that second shot. So this body serve, people need to focus on making a high percentage of first serves. We talk about that yep. all the time. Um, you don't need to be bombing the serve. And to be honest with you, um, if you're serving and volleying, and if that's something you're not comfortable with hitting a spin serve is a better idea because it gives you more time to get forward. Yep. Um, so hitting that body serve, getting forward, keeping that volley low, kind of short. And then the big thing, one of the biggest takeaways from, from hearing you describe it there is, is closing into the net. And that's something I see people execute this play at like a three, five and four Oh level to perfection until the very last shot. And what they'll do is they'll serve and volley They'll hit a decent half volley low, and then they'll stop two feet inside the service line. Yeah. So then that next volley is down at their knees or at their ankles, um, or sometimes they back up and it even bounces again. So really closing the net hard, especially if you know you hit that volley low, kept it over the net, and they have to pop it up. Yeah, you can and really sell out if you, once you hit that shot, if you realize, oh, there's a short and low, you can really close. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you should be able to kind of feel it off your strings if you, yeah. if you hit it good enough. Um, and, you know, if, like I said earlier with these plays, you know, if you run that a few times and they somehow have their running for or running forward lob and it, they lob you a few times, adjust, try a different play, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. cause, cause none of these are perfect, but they, they're, you know, like you said earlier, um, uh, different tools to, to choose from. So. Um, well, any good team is going to figure out what you're doing and then try and combat it. So then you would need to adjust with um, yeah. another one. And yeah, that happens. Absolutely. That's that's pretty that's pretty standard. I mean, you just mix it up. You know, I'm not always going to use the prognosticator. And, and frankly, if you get a high ball, you know, if you get a high ball on the return, you're not. It'd be a mistake to hit the ball short and low. Right. You, know, you would you try and stick that ball. Uh, that's where you do either volley it deeper. What I do, I don't know, Will, if you would agree with this, is I, I go right at the net player with my volley. I go right yeah. at their feet, you know, yeah, somewhere I, in that I think, vicinity. I think it, it depends on um, your own volley skills, uh, how good is the net player yeah. um, on the other side of the net. Uh, certainly worth trying. Do you have a forehand or backhand volley too? Like I, I, I would can do it be on both doing side, that. high balls on both sides. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you have that skill, yeah. I mean, that's absolutely a great, um, a great play. Um, I, my high backhand volley isn't super strong, so I'll usually mm -hmm. just play it back to the uh, baseline player. And I know if I get to the net, I, they're going to have trouble lobbing me. They're going to have trouble getting it by me. So I used um, to, um, I used to be early on high balls a lot, so I'd miss mm -hmm. them. Um, and it was like a little, this is at least what for me, uh, worked for me is a little counterintuitive is I'd almost wait. Um, mm. it, once I started waiting for the ball a little bit more, yeah. um, then I became much more consistent and could kind of swing at it confidently. I don't know if I want to say I almost waited for the ball to be like almost in line with me. I mean, I don't know if that would be what you would actually see if you videoed me hitting a volley, but that's what it kind of feels like. Right. Cause I used yeah. to like kind of try and almost go get the ball and I'm reaching for it. Mm -hmm. And then I would, I would miss the volley, like in the net or Interesting. something. Yeah. Something for people to try if they're having trouble with those high ones. Um, so what about uh, running this in the ad court? So the ad court, honestly, it's the exact, I, I asked Martina about that and she's like, look, as long as the volley is short, low. It doesn't matter. Fine. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So, you know, she, the, the, the little, nuance you might be I, I asked her in the deuce, deuce court I'm like well are you trying to get get it back to the returner's backhand and she's like ideally sure but you know mm -hmm. if you're trying to volley that ball through the middle maybe the net opponent will try and pick it off right so that's something you have to look for but she's like look if you volley it short and low and it goes at the baseline player's forehand they're still hitting a low ball like you know yeah. it's you're you're in a great spot so I wouldn't sweat it too much I think in the ad court, you know, the the more cross court volley is obviously naturally going to go towards a, a righty's backhand more. So that's uh, as perfect, you know, if they're running yeah. for trying to hit a low backhand, like good luck. 
Right, exactly. That's a shot almost no one has, me included. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> maybe some of the pros. <laughs> right. Yeah, so there, there's a balance there. So in the deuce court, um, you know, depending on how far forward you're able to get, how confident you are in your volleys, mm -hmm. ideally you do hit it to the baseline player's backhand. But if you might pop the ball up a little bit, if the other net player is really aggressive, then it's more important to, yeah. to hit it wider. Totally. Um, in that ad court, to be honest with you, like at the at the three five four zero, even four five level, um, I feel like getting it to the backhand and getting to the net is just a winning formula, no matter what. Yep. Um, I can't describe like how many times over the years where I've hit just a terrible volley, but at least it's to the opponent's backhand, and I'm pressuring them at the net, and they just miss. You know. Yep. Try um, and overcook it. Yeah. So it's just like. You know, if you can keep it to the backhand on the ad side, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, it's helpful um, to be a lefty because my serve just naturally goes over there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah there you go. Um, and I get and I get a forehand approach volley. You know, typically as opposed to a backhand. Right, right, right. Okay, so anything else on the prognosticator? I think that's the main. You know, the main takeaway. Like I said, just short and low, force them cool. to hit up, so you can hit awesome. down. Awesome. So a good uh, a good play for people who are trying to serve and volley, add serve and volley to their game, um, things like that. Uh, the next play we've got the upgrade. So tell mm -hmm. us what the upgrade is. Sure. So this is um, so a lot of players uh, really struggle to. Uh, you, let me let me rephrase that. You end up in the one up one back uh, formation a ton. Uh, mm -hmm. even at the pros now, like you get a lot of one up one back, but oh, certainly yeah. at, certainly at the, uh, at the club level where that first volley is, you know, a lot of players are like, okay, I can volley decently when I get to the net, but it's that transition volley. Yeah. It's hard. That's problematic. So people are, people are a little hesitant to move forward and not really sure when I should move forward. So the upgrade is a, uh, is a one up one back play where, mm -hmm. Your team could be serving. You could be returning. It doesn't really, I think the way we positioned it in the playbook is your team serving. But at the yeah. end of the day, it's just, you're in the ad court. Uh, you're, you're at the baseline of the ad court and you're, ra you're rallying cross court. This is one I learned from uh, the Bryan brothers because mm -hmm. you've got, um, so, so Bob's a lefty, Mike is a righty, but Mike would play the ad court. And so his backhand would be, uh, on the outside of the court and his forehand would be on the inside of the court. Mm -hmm. So what let's, let's take it from a serving perspective. Um, if, if Mike were going to serve and stay back, he would hit his serve and then he would immediately shift into the alley. So he would move to his left to get his body into the alley, maybe even be a step outside the alley because he's trying to get the return and any ground stroke he hits after that, he mm -hmm. wants to hit his forehand, right? Instead of hitting a backhand, the shield, he wants to hit the sword. So he can be going cross court, his sword at his opponent's shield, assuming it's a righty. So he basically is just trying to go forehand at the inside out at, forehand. To the yeah, backhand. inside out forehand, exactly at the backhand. Yeah. And then ideally he, you get a weaker shot from the opposing baseline player and then your net player uh, can poach. And this yeah. is a this is a, a good play too, uh, in particular because a lot of uh, club players have weaker backhand volley, so they're a little bit more hesitant to poach in the ad court. But if you see your partner hammer a forehand cross court, that's a good that's kind of a green light, like a good situation for you to go where hopefully the the ball you get, the volley you get, isn't going to be as difficult. It'll be a little bit higher and right and one where you don't have to have the greatest backhand volley to put the put the ball away. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So like if people uh, ever watch um, pro tennis on TV, sometimes they'll show the stats on like miles per hour, forehand and backhand, the yep. backhand's always slower, right? Yep. The backhand's always a slower ground stroke. So it's much easier to, to poach off of a backhand ground stroke than a forehand. So if people are uncomfortable with that, uh, as soon as you see them kind of turn for their backhand, um, you know that that's kind of the green light for you. Uh, so this is one of my favorite plays to run, uh, especially I try to serve and volley almost every time, but when I'm kind of feeling lazy or uh, the serve and volley just isn't working, um, 
I've always done this just because I don't want to hit a backhand ground stroke. <laughs> mm. And that's part of the reason I play doubles too. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't like hitting backhands. So, so I return in the ad court uh, and do this all the time on my return and serve. Um, and yeah, you can really experiment with uh, where to hit this. You can take the person really wide and see if they have trouble with kind of a shorter wide backhand. You can kind of push them back and go for depth. Um, one thing that can happen that I think you mentioned in the video is, is they can run around their backhand too. Sure. Um, so uh, you want to kind of play with some of these variables and figure out what works best. Um, and it's a great way to approach the net too, right? If you know, if you feel that ball coming off your strings and you know you hit a really good forehand, you can come forward. Um, yeah. Especially if your your net player isn't as aggressive. And uh, that rem you, that that reminds me why I, I put it as a serve play is you hit that serve. And then you shift over. Ideally, if you've hit a decent enough serve, the return isn't going to be the greatest shot in the world. So you're now the first player that can take a swing at the forehand. Right. So yeah, yeah, and, that's a good point. Yeah. And so typically, like typically with doubles, uh, you, you have more control over the point when you're serving earlier in the point, right? When you still have the kind of right. ripple effect of the serve where you, then you can take the the next big cut at the ball, the longer the point goes, obviously it, it kind of equalizes and it, the, the plays break down. And yeah, if you actually look at the stats for long points, whether it's singles or doubles is pretty even in terms of which team wins it. It's basically 50, 50. Yeah. Because anything over like five balls. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where there's less strategy at that point. It's kind of more just a coin flip. So that right. would be why, yeah, you want to hit that serve and then immediately shift over and try and set up that second shot. And yeah. then and then the net player would want to probably poach off of virtually anything as long as you hit a good shot. Yeah. Yeah. And they should be reading that, right? Like, where does it land? Hear it come off your partner's strings, things like that. Um, yep. And that reminds me of, uh, so one of uh, the tactics I describe in um, in my ebook is I call it the serve plus one in volley. So this mm. is great for people who have trouble with the serve in volley. Um, so they can use the upgrade and combine it with this, right? Serve, run around forehand, you hit it good, and then you get to the net. Um, and totally. that way you don't have to hit that transition volley as much. Uh, and when you're hitting that run around forehand for your serve plus one, if you hit it with a little more shape, uh, with a little more margin, you'll have more time to get forward and get to the net. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good way to skip that tough uh, no man's land volley. Yeah, yeah. So next, yeah, I'll uh, do that one too. I'll do that one too. Just mm -hmm. you're talking about like sometimes you know my default is to serve and volley, but sometimes like the guys just got a read on your serve or your yeah. serves just not your serves is not any good that day. Yeah, um, you know, and that it, it is you know if you're getting all these tough first volleys, it's just better to serve and then delay that approach hit a ground stroke then get to net yeah yeah absolutely um yeah one thing that is good for people to focus on is like the location of the uh that the return lands so like if the returns are landing around the service line it's going to be kind of tough to serve and volley on because that yeah. that half volley is going to be down around your ankles but if they're hitting with a lot of depth and pushing you back for your serve plus one then you probably can serve in volley because you're going to have that first volley around your, you know, your hips or your chest um, up a little bit higher. So uh, you can kind of consider that when you're trying to decide. Uh, so next we have the, uh, the parachute, which is, um, this is another great one. And I've actually, uh, again, without knowing it, I've added this to my game uh, over the last probably three or so years uh, because people used it against me because I'm a very aggressive net player, especially yeah. when my partner's serving. And I was like, man, when I play a player who has this return down, they totally neutralize me. Um, so I've learned to implement it myself, but let's, let's go through this. What is uh, the parachute? Yeah. So the parachute, this, the, the term parachute I actually got, I mentioned earlier, Yano Zhu, he, he would describe mm -hmm kind of uh it's not really a lob you just imagine you hit like a high-ish ball it could be you know, like it might get over the net player but it doesn't really matter if it does it's almost like imagine putting a parachute on a tennis ball where you just want the ball to kind of slowly come down so just yeah. think like a a high ball quasi lob yeah 
you just want it to kind of hang in the air. Um, and so you would do this in the deuce court. You are returning in this. So this is a return play. You're doing it in the deuce court. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this really, you know, Will, you're facing Will and Will is poaching all the time and picking all this stuff up, uh, stuff off. So you're like, oh gosh, how do I neutralize this guy? Um, so door number one is you just try and hit, you know, passing shots down the line, but uh, you might miss them. You know, it's tough to hit that yes. super precise um, right. pass down the line off of serve, first serve. If you don't hit a great shot, then net player just volleys it for a winner, points over. Right. So instead you hit this, like, again, this parachute, like a quasi lob down mm -hmm. the line. And the, the thing that's like kind of key about it is you don't care if your opponent gets a racket on it or not. Um, yeah. Ideally they don't, but if they do whatever, uh, because it is going to be a high backhand uh, overhead, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the hardest shot in tennis to hit for club players for sure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So <laughs> again, this is the, the net, you know, you're in the deuce court, the net opponent is right-handed. They're being super aggressive. So they're already leaning to the middle of the court. So you just need to get it over their uh, backhand shoulder you know, high over their back. So it's not like a high backhand volley. It's like a overhead, like they're, they have to reach for it. So they can't get any leverage on it. Yeah. Ideally they'd have to like take a step back. They'd be moving backwards to get a racket on it. Right. And so that shot is like almost always going to go back through the middle of the court. So mm -hmm. once you hit it, you would kind of shift to the middle, anticipating the ball coming back through the middle uh, to you. And then, um, and then that next ball, honestly, you could, you could either hit it through the middle of the court. That's always a safe spot, or you could hit it right back at the, the net player. Cause they're now back by the service line and whatever shot you hit would be like low at their feet. Right. Um, and then if obviously they, they can even make that shot. Yeah. <laughs> so they can even make it. And then if, obviously if it gets over their head, then you just fall it to net. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, um, sorry, go ahead. No, that was it. That was essentially, I'm okay. I'm, um, yeah, so, so my favorite thing about this strategy, and like I said, I, I've added this to my game and I use it a lot against aggressive net players. Um, and for anybody listening, when you ever played me, it's a great strategy against me. Um, but the thing I love about it is you're returning to both players' backhands, assuming they're both right-handed. Mm -hmm. So so you're, you're hitting it slow down the line. If the net player gets it, it's a high backhand overhead, which – almost nobody um at 4-0 or below has yeah. Yeah. uh and then the server's hitting a running backhand which if you follow it into the net like you said they're gonna put a you're gonna put a lot of pressure on them and they're probably gonna miss that backhand i'd say maybe 50 60 percent of the time by trying to go for too much um sometimes they might lob you you know you'll, you'll have to adjust from there but just making yeah. that return totally neutralizes that advantage you talked about earlier that the serve team has, because um, now you have two at the net and they're hitting a backhand. Um, another thing I think to think about when you're executing this, uh, one thing that I like to do is step forward a lot on this return, um, because if you're waiting pretty far back, that gives that net player plenty of time to recover. Um, yeah. So if, if you can step forward, it doesn't even have to really be a high lob because They've got their momentum towards the middle of the court. You're hitting it down the line. You've taken away all their time by stepping forward. Um, so if you can do that, I, I think that's yeah, that's a good that's a good tip. That's a that's good, good tip. as well. Um, and it works and well. It works well if you're facing somebody that hits a lot of wide serves, because then you're yeah. uh, then you then you can actually hit the ball into the court, so you're less likely to miss it wide. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. Like you'll see, um, and I see it when I'm at the net, right. Uh, since I'm an aggressive net player, um, I'll see these returners in the deuce court, just go nuts trying to beat me down the line. And they never try this. Like they keep trying to whack returns down the yeah. line and they'll make one out of four or something. And we'll hold at 40, 15 every single time. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's crazy. Um, crazy to see that. Uh, so what about doing this in the ad court? Talk a little bit about that. Well, ad court is tough because that's where you're now hitting, you know, a, a, a parachute down the line is a overhead, mm -hmm. you know, a normal overhead. It's right into, you know, the sword side, the forehand side. So it doesn't really work as well. You can, you can do it uh, if 
your opponent is not serving and volleying, and then you can just hit the thing cross court mm -hmm. and hit okay. a high ball back at at uh, the opposing you know baseline player if they're staying. But it only works if they're staying back. You know, if they're coming yeah. in, then it's going to be a high volley for them, and you know you're going to get your partner tagged. Right. Um, so it's not as effective in the uh, in the ad court because even if you hit that high ball, you let it go back. If if you know the other the baseline player might run around and hit a forehand. And right. then they're and, they're and hammering the server. A, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The server is kind of hammering, kind of like a you know, kind of a some essentially a sitter. Yeah. So it's not as great. I mean, this is just you got to feel it out. I mean, if you're playing a you know in the ad court, you're gonna the net player, the opposing net player is gonna be poaching on their backhand. So I mean, if they're being super aggressive and picking off all your stuff, then it can be effective because again, it's that high backhand, which can yeah. be which can be good. You can do a little bit more with it cross court because you have a little bit more court to work right you know you get what another four feet basically mm -hmm. uh to work with if you go cross court uh and still have the ball bounce in so it's uh it's not as good but it's certainly something you can try if the uh, uh net player is killing you yeah yeah and it, it'll definitely work against a, a lefty there at the net um as well uh, or lefty server, I guess, since they'll, they'd have a right. Yeah, I'm trying backhand. to think, like, what would you, like, well, what would you do there? Like, would that be the first, like, if you're getting killed by the net player on the return, would your first option be to try the parachute or would it be to have your partner move back? Maybe play two back. Um, I've done two back. Uh, usually, um, Usually I can make the down the line return. Okay. You can make it um, bump your back end. If you swing it wide, your back end. Yeah. Like I, I'm a, like, I'm not a good server, but I'm a pretty good returner. Okay. Uh, so returning is not an issue for me, but I mean, if, if, uh, yeah, it, if I saw that, um, or let's say I'm playing like a five, five team or something and, and they are that good. Uh, yeah, I, I think my initial thought would be, can I return this down the line? Um, if not, I would definitely bring my partner back uh, just to buy more time on the volleys. Mm -hmm. um, since they have a backhand volley, most people are going to struggle to put that ball away. Um, you know, if I'm playing a 5-5 team, probably not. But, uh, you know, for most people listening, you know, if you hit a solid cross-court return, added a backhand volley, and you're playing two back, you're going to be able to stay in the point most of the time. Um, so I think that's where I would start uh, if you're having trouble with the down the line return. Um, and you can always try the parachute. I mean, if they're super aggressive, uh, depending on their mobility, they may not be able to recover to it. So, yeah, that's true. If they're, that's, that's fair point. Yeah. 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 So it, it depends, you know, if you're playing some young 25 year old, who's running all over the court, they're going to be able to get over to it. But I know a lot of people listening, uh, me included or past their prime. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, another thing I wanted to ask about, uh, one thing you mentioned in this video on the, the parachute return was, was choosing your return before the point. So, uh, I think it was back in the deuce court. You said, if it goes down the T to your backhand, you're doing this. If it goes to your forehand, you're doing this. Talk about the importance of, of deciding before the point. Um, yeah, well, I mean like the T serve in the deuce court, um is the 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 parachute is more likely to go over the forehand shoulder mm -hmm. so it's it's tougher to to thread that needle obviously if you try and try and get it over the backhand you could hit it wide yeah uh so that's why the uh you know the wider the the wider serves are better times to do it because it just has that natural angle back into the court and you're going over over someone's um someone's backhand uh backhand shoulder so you know a lot of times you could say okay if this ball is wide i'm gonna go parachute and then if it's t i'll try and get it cross court or maybe mm -hmm. even just rip it down the line yeah yeah and that's that's really um uh especially on like well i was gonna say big points but really in general like knowing where you're gonna return before the point is huge because uh so many times when you're playing these aggressive net players, they'll make you kind of second guess and change yeah. direction on your return. And, and uh, they're able to force errors that way. So it's really important to just, yeah. 
Yeah, just stick with uh, what you decided before the point and adjust next time and, and make them hit the volley. You know, sometimes, uh, especially at our level, I mean, sometimes they'll miss the, the volley anyways. So, um, you know, missed returns, uh, <laughs> they are, um, yeah, they kind of kill, kill me when I see a lot of missed returns. So, yeah, sometimes like early, early in a match, especially because like, you know, I, I don't know, uh, Will, if this happens to you, but like, you're not necessarily completely warmed up in the first couple of games. Yeah, um, it does. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'll just hit every single return down the line. Oh, really? This game. And like, yeah. I don't want to say I'm trying to throw the game, but I'm just, I want to be like dictating uh, my relationship with the net opponent, right? Like mm -hmm. I want them to be like, oh, this dude's going down the line all the time. So it maybe makes them a little bit more passive later. Right. And I plant that seed in the first game or two. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea, especially because most people, even if you, let's say you hit like five of them and you only make one or two, the odds are in their favor to just let you keep doing that. If you make two, that's 40%, right? Yeah. But mo yeah. most people, if they get beat twice, it feels like they lost seven points, you know? So they're going to start covering that alley, even if you only made two out of five. Particularly um, at the club level where there's just the natural tendency to overcover the alley. Right. Know? So you can just right. kind of lean on that existing mistake and get people to make it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. So let's go through a few rapid fire questions. Then sure. we'll let people know uh, where they can get um, the, the doubles playbook. So uh, what is your favorite uh, tournament? So I got to, uh, I probably got to give it to, to Indian Wells. Um, I've been to all the majors, which are, which are all awesome for a number of different reasons, but uh, mm -hmm. I think Indian Wells is actually the one that the pros vote their favorite tournament every year. Yeah. I think they, yeah, they have in the past at least. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's, it's, if you've never been, uh, it's in Palm Springs, California, just the venue is great. Uh, it's owned by Larry Ellison, the CEO of, or at least former CEO of, or I don't think he's CEO anymore, but um, he's dumped a bunch of his Oracle money into the tournament. Yeah. So it's just a really, really nice facility. It's, it's, there's a lot of space. So it's not cramped in a way that, that um, like, I love the French is. open, <laughs> yeah, even uh, New York for sure. But like the French open, which I love, I mean, the, the clay court is great. Uh, uh, the red clay is great. And I know they've done some renovations, but there've been times when I was like, like getting onto a court is like going through TSA security. Oh, geez. Uh, you know, and so it's once you get on a court, you like don't even want to go to the bathroom because <laughs> you're like, I'm not going to get back on the court for two hours. Yeah. Um, and I think they might have. They, you know, I know they've been making some upgrades. I haven't been there uh, candidly since I think 2012. Okay. So it's been a minute uh, and it's an awesome Like I would totally say to go, but but it was it was a little bit of a pain to navigate around. Yeah. So Indian um, Wells, Indian Wells, yeah, all the players are there, um, and uh, uh, it's just and uh, Will, you know, we were uh, I, that was the first time we ever met in person, right? I think, uh, I uh, think so, it was, yeah. It was about a month yeah. ago at Indian Wells, just hanging out with like Craig O'Shannon and some other folks. So it's just just uh, from a personal standpoint, it's where I see a lot of my friends in the industry. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, so awesome it's just tournament. It's like a reunion. And they have great uh, doubles year. crowds too, which is, uh, yeah. which we love to see. True. Yeah. They, they actually do a good job of um, getting a lot of the top players to play dubs in a way you would never see at a major. Um, right. Cause it's five sets and they don't have, you know, they, they got to focus on the singles. Right. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite tennis book? Uh, my favorite, the one I read, I think this is, I think the the two that are kind of like like the quote unquote like rite of passage books are the ones that everybody needs to read is uh, the inner game of tennis, yeah, um, and uh, and uh, the inner the inner game of tennis. Or, I just <laughs> said that. Wow, dyslexia. Um, and winning ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> the those two are books both. that are amazing are the inner game of tennis and the inner game of tennis. I you thought you were trying books. to like emphasize that one, like. <laughs> No, I was not. I was not. <laughs> I, I should have just played it off like I was. Um, no, that was a dyslexic moment. Um, All good. An another one was, uh, uh, which I found interesting, was With Winning in Mind by Lanny Bassham. Oh, okay. um, and it's more like that. mental game. This is a guy who wanted to be a professional athlete, but he like wasn't a good athlete. Mm -hmm. So he ended up becoming 
uh, a shooter. Like he had a, like he was shooting like a rifle, I don't, or like a marksman. Yeah. And he ended up uh, becoming the best shooter in the world and winning the Olympics in the late seventies or eighties or something like that. But it was all about how he was able to um, kind of gain control over his performance and, and, and have a, have a, a strong mental game. So I thought hmm. that one was, was good because it's kind of more of a step-by-step -step of what you should do um, down awesome. to something like, you know, I think it's like pull the trigger on an exhale, you know, like don't yeah. be holding your breath when you like very specific stuff in terms of how he approached his, his performance. So that one, that one was an interesting read. Cool. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. I've not read that one of, I think the other was, two and definitely yeah, I highly recommend those. I think that was the first time I heard, I, I was introduced to the concept of outcome versus process mm. where like the, the number one mental mistake is, is focusing on an outcome. Cause then you, yeah. you're either in the future uh, or you're in the past. If it brings up like a bad memory of a time you choked or something like that, but either way you, um, you know, a lot of times you push and that's because you get physically tight and then, Right. You, you can't swing fully. And so you always hear professional athletes talk about the process, the process, the, the next game in front of us. So uh, it's almost trite at this point, but he kind of broke down what his process was. So that yeah, was, that I, was a good one. I feel like you can't uh, hear like too many lessons on that, um, that outcome versus process sure. uh, lesson. It's like, it's so, so important. And you see, you hear it from so many different angles, but um yeah, I feel like you can't hear it enough. Yeah, uh, to be honest with you. Um, what's your favorite non-tennis book? Um, well, related to the the outcome versus process is uh, have you ever read uh, Atomic Habits by uh, James Clear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have. Yeah, that awesome one book. That one was was a, a real game changer. Uh, and and the premise of the book is the reason it's called Atomic Habits is because he means like really small, like an atom. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about just behavioral change um, and how you can improve, you know, anything, uh, any, whether it's a sport or, you know, if you want to learn guitar or whatever, um, how you can do that in a methodical, um, but, but small way. Uh, and one mm -hmm. of them, just by little changes in habits. And one of the interesting things that always stuck with me was that he said, if you improve by 1% at something every day, so you just get 1% better every day, by the end of a year, you'll be 37 times better at whatever that activity is. Yeah. So it just reinforced the, the importance of these little tweaks in, yeah. in how you approach stuff. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he goes through the whole process in the book of like how you, because he was a baseball player and he talked about how he did it for baseball and then talks about how you can apply it to, to anything, you know, whether it's learning guitar, weight loss, getting work done, you know, writing a yeah. book if you're trying to do that. Yeah. Getting better at tennis. Sure. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite books for sure. Um, I actually wrote uh, a while back. I wrote a blog post about like why you shouldn't get angry on the tennis court. And I, I refer to one of his um, articles on anger and like what it does to the mind. Hmm. And he, he, I think he cites like all these studies and like, um, the premise is anger, like na really narrows the mind, uh, and narrows your focus. So if you're like, how does that apply to the tennis court? Well, if you're out on the tennis court and you're like getting angry cause you just double faulted or you missed an overhead or something, you're not going to be able to see as many, um, like strategic possibilities to mm -hmm. kind of get yourself out of that situation. Um, so it's not just bad to like be angry on the court because you look like an idiot or because your parents told you to quit getting angry. It actually, um, at least I think like it actually decreases your odds of winning the match. Uh, Interesting. For, Unless for you're that. John McEnroe. Yeah. I guess some people can use that anger as like motivation to try harder. Um, I haven't factored that in maybe. Or but, he focuses uh, on the, on the, <laughs> the right thing, despite himself. I don't I think for 99% <laughs> of people, it's probably the wrong way to, to approach it. <laughs> yeah. It never I'm not worked sure for me. It's the, I'm not sure it's the healthiest approach, but uh, probably not. Anyways. Um, what is, uh, tell us your favorite tennis story. Well, the one that um, we were talking about before we, uh, uh, before we started the, the podcast um, 
is uh, I, I, when I was coaching in real life, I was coaching at this place called uh, the tennis center at college park out in um, college park, Maryland, right outside Washington, DC, where I live. And I would show up at work every day. And uh, the janitor was uh, an immigrant from, I believe Sierra, Sierra Leone. Um, and uh, he was living in like literally the broom closet with his two kids. Mm-hmm. And so I would show up at work and every day uh, his two kids would run out of the broom closet and then run around the facility and hit tennis balls and uh, just kind of goof around. I think there were five at the time. And um, one of those kids uh, is Francis Tiafo. <laughs> so who's now what is he 30 in the world or something like that so uh his dad's name is constance um he's an awesome dude but it's just crazy that uh, the place i used to work mm-hmm. uh, like francis was literally like i said living in the broom closet now he's one of the best tennis players in the world he is an awesome uh awesome guy so i am um the whole family is so i'm i'm very very happy that he has uh been as as successful uh as he's been yeah. Yeah. He's a fun player to watch too. We, um, I had, uh, Blair Henley on the podcast, um, about a month or two ago. And, and she said, he's one of her favorite people to interview and she's interviews, you know, everybody in tennis from Federer sure. to Serena to, uh, and she said, he's one of the most entertaining, like genuine yep. down to earth guys. Um, yep. so, right. uh, yeah, awesome, awesome story. Um, how do we make pro doubles more popular? Man, that is that I was, I, <laughs> I ask everyone this and there's uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, approaches and answers. I'm just going to give a very like specific uh, niche. Is it niche or niche? Does it, mm, how do, I think either one. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, probably um, uh, depends on your dialect. Um, so I would say uh, they should, take all the pro point, like, like interesting points from, this is a very niche, niche strategy. And now I'm in my head about which one I should use. Um, (laughs) They should uh, take um, cool points from the pro tour and then make them YouTube shorts and then just upload like a couple points every day on ATP or on uh, Wimbledon or something like that. I've seen a lot of folks doing that with, with either their own tennis points, like literally just like random people who are playing and they're creating like, here's this point I played Mm -hmm. or they're doing with pro points, singles, and they're getting an an enormous amount of views. Yeah. So I think just trying to um, get, uh, get the stuff out there in like kind of like micro, micro content to raise awareness. And just show like the most intense or the most exciting kind of moments Something like that i don't know if it's yeah. a good idea but it was like a narrow it was the best yeah. i could come up with as an internet guy. no i i think that would work uh some of um uh some of the best feedback i get on some of my videos are are these like point of the week videos i do yeah where i, I take a point and i just talk over the video and say like here's where they hit it here's why yep. they should have done this instead and and so on um and i actually did one a couple months ago on a ter- uh, a point from uh, Coco Golf and Katie McNally at the US Open. And within, I think two weeks, probably, I got a notification from YouTube uh, that USTA flagged it for uh, <laughs> copyright. Um, so I was doing like free marketing for them. And then, of course, they flagged it for copyright. So did, uh, were you um, offering commentary on it? Uh, yeah, I was talking like over the, the video. So uh, this is talking about strategy. uh, This is the uh, uh, proverbial, like I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV, but um, you probably transformed that sufficiently to like work with fair use. Hmm. Um, Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm sure you have lawyer. I'm sure you have lawyer listeners. I'll consult with my lawyer and uh, check it out. (laughs) Yeah. If if anybody is listening to this as a copyright lawyer, please leave a comment. um, Let us know. uh, on fair use because <laughs> we run into like similar stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think if you like, if you take, if you take like a video and you like transform, it means like make it turn it from entertainment, which is what watching sports is to like education, which is what you were doing by adding. Yeah. 
comment in, in it there's always like a gray area where it's like how much did you transform it etc cetera, etc cetera. but sure huh, interesting I'll, um, I'll check that out um yeah it blows my mind how like the, i think the french open does the same thing with like a lot of their videos on twitter they'll just like pull them down when it's like free marketing for them that, yeah which know, is I like could do a whole this, episode on that <laughs> this, this is what people tuned in they they thought they were tuning in for doubles and now we're gonna well, they're getting a very uh, yeah. uh in-depth legal discussion of <laughs> fair use in 2022 yeah maybe we'll do a round two on that um so how talk about uh, how changeovers <laughs> so how can people get the playbook uh uh, the doubles playbook with all 48 plays. Yeah, they're, um, they're on, uh, they're on our website, um, fuzzy yellow Um, okay. or were we going to set up a link? Was that how? Are yeah. We gonna do so, that? so let's do, um, yeah, let's do the tennis tribe.com slash doubles dash playbook. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, so people can go there and, um, and get all 48 plays. They get access to, um, the app they'll get a physical copy um with all the plays mm. uh and a video for there's a video for every one of the plays right for there's each a video one. for everyone and actually if you go to that um um what was it the tennis tribe.com backslash doubles dash playbook yeah um we'll set it up though martina navitz lover herself will show you the prognosticator so the one we were talking about oh, earlier she'll actually walk you through it and then if you're like oh this is cool you can get it perfect yeah that's it'll that's be like awesome a little preview yeah cool yeah for people who uh need that kind of visual element that should help um awesome so thanks for coming on will uh, i appreciate it well this was fun man i always like talking about dubs um we'll have to next time we'll have to organize an actual hit yeah yeah we should do uh, like maybe a video or something on the court next time so yep. um awesome well thanks again thanks everybody for listening and uh we'll link to everything in the show notes and i will talk to you next time if you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches, then join the Tennis Tribe Doubles Strategy Newsletter. Every single Thursday, I'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match. And when you join, you're going to get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will. I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe, and over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays, with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So to sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.